So first, thank you, um, Angela, Monica, and Miles for uh, the invitation to speak um, in these venues. And I have to say that has been a great company throughout the whole pandemic. So I'm sorry that it comes to an end since for this season, but I'm really honored to give the last talk. And as such, this is more of a colloquium talk that uh, um, is going to touch upon many different topics. And so I hope this will be inspiration, especially for the youngest uh, among all of us to uh, continue in the many directions that have been open in the last um, you know, decades. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, a series of pictures. And they look um, sort of uh, independent from each other in the sense that in the first one here, um, you see like this is a um, fiber optic fiber, like a rendering, a little cartoon of that. And this is the next one is a, a nice uh, drawing that you can make in the parent, uh, is a parent tree. So you, it's used um, as an important example in the harmonic analysis. Then rays of light and a beautiful rainbow. Um, and then you see here um, an ellipse or think of it a circle if you like. And uh, um, the, uh, the paper has been uh, printed with a, a Z2 lattice. And this uh, dotted uh, points here are the intersection between this ellipse and this uh, uh, lattice. And it seems strange that this should come up somehow in a, in a talk that deals with uh, PDEs. It's more like something like counting these points is more something that you do in analytic number theory, but I'll get to that. And this is a picture of what I like to think about dispersion. Um, in fact, like this is like some concentric waves in a nice, think about infinite lake with no boundaries yet. And uh, um, you see the height of the wave is shrinking and that's exactly what it means dispersion. And the interesting fact is that although the height, the amplitude of the wave shrinks, the energy remains constant. And this is a more turbulent situation. This is, uh, um, I like to think of this related to very important problem that has been somehow, um, for some reason, studied really uh, deeply in the last uh, few years, the water wave problem. And the last picture is a, um, a rendering of the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, which as I will explain later in a couple of slides, is very much connected with the Schrodinger equation. So I'm using the Schrodinger equation to actually touch up as an example of a dispersive equation and also to touch upon the fact that in order to study it, uh, you really need to use tools from a, a very diverse group of ideas that comes, okay, clearly from harmonic and Fourier analysis since you're gonna have to um, study interactions or waves uh, what you want to do is uh, take your complicated wave, uh, turn it into a sum in a certain sense of a simpler wave, interact them and then reconstruct. And this uh, idea of reconstruction is actually a very deep idea in harmonic analysis. As I mentioned before, we, via the picture, there are some tools from analytic number theory that actually have been brought into this kind of um, uh, setting, the PDE setting, in particular dispersive uh, equation setting by Bourguin. Then of course, math physics, and I will show you an example of dynamical system. And uh, uh, just for this talk, I uh, will give you towards the end, um, I will touch slightly upon the concept of symplectic geometry and how that enters also in uh, this uh, um, PDE. And I'm afraid I will not get to the probability part, but uh, there is a pretty large literature now and can give reference at the end uh, if anybody wants it. Okay, so um, in order to guide my sort of little tour um, in all of these different aspects that uh, come together for a single equation, let me use just as a placeholder the um, NLS, nonlinear Schrodinger. So this is I, the complex, and then partial derivative in T, Laplace and U. Lambda is a constant, which could be plus or minus one. I will, um, I will tell you in a moment, to, for example, where it comes in. And then the cubic nonlinearity. U is a, obviously a function in time and space. And for this talk and to describe all these different tools, um, I will think of X to be in the torus of dimension D. Now, why the torus? Well, that simply means that I'm considered the periodic case. So the function u 
is a periodic function in terms of space to start with. And we have our initial condition, that's uh, um, what happens at time zero. So this is the initial profile you wave, and it's uh, u dot x, u not that x. And usually you measure the regularity of this initial condition uh, using L2 base space, so Sobole space and so on, because they're very natural for this problem for the following reason. Since this uh, equation comes from physics, has conservation laws. So the first conservation law is the integral of the absolute value of u. By the way, u is a complex function here. Is the, in the integral of the absolute value of u square. So this is the L2 norm square, and that's called the mass, and that's conserved. Um, another conservation law is the Hamiltonian or the energy. So it's the first term is the kinetic energy. That's the gradient of u square. And then there's the potential energy, which depends on what kind of nonlinearity you adopt. And here is the cubic, so the potential energy is of order four. And again, this constant lambda appears. And if lambda is plus one, the, the problem is called defocusing. And in fact, the Hamiltonian is always positive and it gives definitely a bound on the um, homogeneous H1 norm. And if lambda is negative, there might be a competition between these two terms and the blow up might occur, but I will not talk about that in this talk. Okay, so let me, um, because I'm adopting this uh, equation in order to explain a bunch of things, so let me start first from um, at least one place where it is derived physically. So I'm gonna describe in very, very general terms the Bose-Einstein condensate. So this phenomenon occurs when you have, let's assume, a, a, a container with a very diluted gas, both particles, and uh, um, because the gas is very diluted, instead of thinking of the dynamics in terms of uh, uh, particles that collide with each other and hence more billiard balls uh, dynamics, we're going to uh, um, instead think of each particle as a little uh, wave packet in the fact that uh, we start at uh, a temperature um, um, uh, that is not so low yet, the, um, the wavelength and the distance between the wave packets uh, is not comparable yet. But then we lower the temperature and at some point, at some critical temperature, the, as you see in this picture, the wavelength and the distance between the wave packet becomes comparable and things start happening. And as you lower the temperature yet again to the absolute zero, you will see this coalescing that happens in the giant matter wave. In other words, what's going on here is that this little wave packets that originally, basically, since they are so diluted, have an independent dynamics almost, they all lose that independence, they coalesce in one unique big wave. Um, now we can approximate this uh, um, example, instead of taking t that goes to zero, we can take the number of particles that goes to infinity. You can make that transition as well. So let me try to describe it a little bit more mathematically without really writing anything because um, the notation is extremely heavy here. So when we start with uh, the little wave packets, the temperature not yet at absolute zero, we describe the dynamics that involves this uh, um, wave packets. This, at this moment, let's say you have n, where n is very large of them. You can describe that system using the so-called BBGKY hierarchy. Then the goal is taking the limit as n goes to infinity and describe what happens to that limit. And that corresponds to taking the temperature goes to zero. When you do that, um, that taking the limit as n goes to infinity, then you end up with uh, the gross Petaviesky hierarchy. And I'm not going to write it for you, but uh, um, this uh, um, it's a system um, of uh, n equations. Each one of them is linear, but there is an interaction between all the components of that. But let me tell you just a little bit what happens to this, without writing it explicitly, what happens to the solutions of this hierarchy. Um, in, by the way, this uh, limit procedure and then proving that there is a unique uh, solution for this gross Petavetsky it, it was a very, very hard problem, especially in three dimension. I will talk a little bit more about this later. Anyway, from a, a little bit of a mathematical point of view, 
um, let's think in the following terms. So this description works uh, both in RD or in KD, so periodic or non-periodic. And we assume that uh, let's indicate this large vector xk um, itself is uh, made of each component's a vector itself. So the k indicates, let's think about the number of particles if you like, and x1 up to xk um, could indicate the position if you like. So xi is in either R, D, or TD. And uh, we have this gross proteasis hierarchy, which I'm, I didn't write, but let's give an initial data to it. And this initial data, I'm thinking of it as a product of two functions. It's a, there is a physical reason for that, but that because it should represent some kind of density. Anyway, it's a product of two functions. The function u0 in uh, xj, and it's conjugate in x prime j. And this product is called, we call it gamma zero K, and it's the initial data for my big system of the gross Petavieski. This is called factorized initial data. Now we evolve it, and what you can prove, and like I said, this is not at all a simple fact, what you can prove is that this uh, evolution is a new function, gamma K, T, now is evolved, so there is a variable T, also depending on x k and x prime k. And the remarkable fact is that it's the product of functions themselves. And this uh, u is nothing else than the evolution of u zero via the cubic NLS equation. So that's the connection. Now, um, there are many people who worked on this. I just wanted to mention very few, but very, very important ones. So. Uh, Spon originally, and then Erdos, Schlein, and Yao, they were the people who actually made all this mathematically very sound around 2007 with a, a series of paper. Then there was a Macedon and a Kleinerman Macedon after uh, Erdos, Schlein, and Yao that gave a more uh, friendly version of the, of the proof. Uh, for people who work in dispersive equation, although they had to assume some, uh, uh, it's a conditional result, but uh, um, it was very, very important, I think, to bridge the uh, math physics community with the people working in dispersive equation. And then Kirkpatrick, uh, Schlein, and myself attacked the periodic case. The, uh, the previous works were on R, D, R, N, if you like. And then there is our two teams that have been working on this very much recently, Tom Chen and Pavlovich, Natasha Pavlovich, IUT Austin, and X Chen and Olmer at uh, uh, Brown. Okay, so um, in this talk, it's very common that uh, I, um, you know, I, I give just the beginning of the story and then I move on on a different aspect of it. And in fact, let's move on to the following fact. Many of you know that uh, um, the one dimension of cubic NLS is actually very special, both in R and in the circle, because this is an integrable system. Now, there are many different ways that one can describe what integrability uh, means, but um, some of the words that you definitely heard about it is the existence of the lax pair, um, uh, the inverse scattering theory, and of course, the most, probably the most famous one is the fact that this equation satisfies not just the conservation of mass and uh, energy or Hamiltonian, but actually has infinitely many conserved integrals. And these integrals look uh, basically like this. The first part is uh, the derivative of order S, where S is a natural number, and then there are lower order terms. Now, one question that uh, uh, with uh, some of my collaborators, in particular, um, uh, Dana Mendelssohn, who was a former student of mine, and Andrea Namold and Natasha Paolic, one question that we asked was, okay, if the equation here is uh, uh, integrable, as it's a beautiful structure, what happens to the gross Petavieski, which is, uh, is somehow uh, the bigger system that uh, connects with the NLS the way I described before? Is anything like the, some kind of integrability for the larger hierarchy of the gross Petaviesk, of course, in dimension one. So we uh, try to look for lax pair or um, trying to describe a more geometric structure here. But uh, what we did in one first paper was to actually prove that there are infinitely many conserved quantities. But we expected more, we expected more geometric structure. And so we went back to look at the problem and I want to report on that. 
So this is just a little cartoon to explain a bit uh, what is the situation. So in what I described to you before in terms of where the um, both Einstein condensate come from and how the Gross-Petavieski is related to the Schrodinger equation, basically this is what happened. You have a many body system. That's the one described by the BBGKY equation. So this is the many particles here. And you take the limit as n goes to infinity, you go to the gross Petavieski, and then there is a, that relationship that I described between the gross Petavieski solutions and solution of the Schrodinger equation. Now, let's move over. If we look at just at the Schrodinger equation, where there is a lot of work that has been done over the year, um, studying very much in detail the beautiful structure um, given in, a, in the name of a Hamiltonian structure, in the sense that there is a canonical Poisson structure in there as well. Um, there is, a, in a way, a geometric and algebraic description of a, a very nice relationship that happens among solutions of these equations. And if one want to read a little bit more about it, or if you wanted to have a, an idea what I'm talking about, well, the work of Palais definitely um, does a lot of that. So then the question is, well, what happens at the level of the many body system and what happens at the level of the uh, Gross-Petavieski? Where does this beautiful algebraic and geometric structure of the NLS comes from when you take this limit? So can we say something all the way on the top with the many body system? Can we say something about the hierarchy? Can we actually find structure here and then move it to the limit? I mean, what's up here? And there was really nothing in uh, literature except for um, some papers that were considered more on the physics literature, or um, you know, physicists are wonderful in the guessing formulas and things like that. So we went back to, um, to see what was going on there. So then, um, so let me pose first four questions and then a report on uh, what we did. And uh, um, because this, I'm trying to keep things very general, I'm not going to overload you with a bunch of notations. I'm just going to use notation, which are pretty standards, but I'm, I'm, I spare you the details. So the first question that I want to ask is the, is the following. So can the gross petavieski hierarchy be realized as a Hamiltonian equation of motion? So this was no known. In other words, can you write, so big gamma here is basically the infinite um, uh, the infinite vector that has um, solutions of the Gross-Petavieski. So can you do, can you say that the derivative of gamma is equal to some vector field which is related to the um, Hamiltonian vector field, related to the Hamiltonian of the Gross-Petavieski, which we don't know whether exists or not yet, but uh, we are wondering whether we can find the Hamiltonian, the related Hamiltonian vector field, so that we can write the Gross-Petavieski in this way. And so um, uh, describe a certain Poisson structure and all of that. So this is totally known when we look at the Schrodinger equation only, and it was not known for the Gross-Petavieski. And then uh, even going a little bit further upwards, in a sense, um, can we say that this, uh, if we are able to prove something for the gross petavieski can we say that it comes from a Poisson structure and a Hamiltonian structure that uh, is related with the, the um, end particle system? So basically, can we find a, a Hamiltonian in the BBGKY at the level n, such that we can write the BBGKY hierarchy again has a, a Hamiltonian system and then take the limit and converge to the gross petavieski Now the next two questions are related to the integrability. So we are now reduced to dimension equals one. And uh, the question is the following, does the gross petavieski uh, hierarchy possess an integrable stu structure in the sense that we have infinitely many Hamiltonians and that commute with respect to the Poisson um, um, the, uh, the Poisson structure in there. And one of this, um, infinitely many Hamiltonians, should be the Hamiltonian of the gross petavieski that gives us the representation of the gross petavieski as a Hamiltonian system. And uh, um, next to this, um, as we know, the um, Hamiltonian 
for uh, the Schrodinger equation is the one attached to the Schrodinger equation that we know, but the other many, infinitely many Hamiltonians give uh, what we call end Schrodinger equation. Is this the same or is it, is it true also in the case of the gross Petavinsky? Okay, so I'm happy to report that for all these four questions, the answers are yes. And uh, this is a relatively recent work by Dana Mendelssohn, Andreana Maud, Natasha Pavlovich, a student of Natasha Pavlovich, Matt Rosenweg, and myself. Um, so <laughs> these are very long papers, and I'm gonna summarize them just in two lines. And for question one and two, so these were questions just in terms of uh, Hamiltonian structures of both uh, gross petavesky and BBGKY hierarchy and uh, whether there was a, a geometric con uh, construction in there. So the geometric construction that we proved, it's in a sense a quantization version of the Poisson structure that were already presented by some physicists, in particular Marsden, Morrison, and Weinstein. In terms of the integrability, also in that case, uh, we established the existence of an infinite sequence of energies or Hamiltonians, if you like, that commute with respect to the Ponce structure that we had to, of course, uh, uh, put forward from scratch. And in a sense, this is, a, again, a quantized version of the work of Palais done for the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop here in terms of describing this work, because if I say anything more, and then I have to start putting a lot of definitions in there, which I think is really not worth it. What I think it's important is to say that we have all this uh, um, uh, much, much um, solid, more solid uh, algebraic and geometric structure for this uh, um, uh, hierarchies, if you like. So now I'm gonna move, for, move on and I'm gonna go back to uh, the origin in a sense. So I'm gonna take my, um, uh, equation that I have uh, stated from the beginning this is the cubic NLS. I'm not worried about the dimension for now. I have an initial data. I'm not worried about the regularity or anything like that. But what I want to say is that uh, um, in principle, when you want to prove that there is a, a solution, that you, the solution is unique, and there is a stability of, this, uh, um, of the dynamics, you want to stay in within the spaces dictated to you by the um, uh, conservation laws, because those are the physical meaning, uh, meaningful integrals of uh, attached to the equation itself. So in particular, uh, the mass and the Hamiltonian, which contains the kinetic part, which has one derivative of the solution itself. So clearly, if you want to stay within those spaces, then taking two derivatives here is not something that you want to do. Um, and so you want to transform this problem into a weaker version of it. And this is what you do by using the Duhamel principle. So using the Duhamel principle in this description, just like you do for the ODE, then you can say that the, um, the solution that I'm looking for, it solves this integral equation where the first term is uh, the solution of the linear Schrodinger equation. And the second part is the non-homogeneous term. Now this ST, I like to think of it as the Schrodinger group. And in particular, ST applied at U0, which is the linear solution, solves this very simple system here where the initial data is U0x. Now, um, this double R is misleading because if you have a classical solution, you certainly have um, a solution to the um, to this integral equation, but the, if you have a solution to the integral equation, you might not have enough derivative to, for example, take the Laplacian of it. Uh, so we're going to settle to uh, find solutions of the inter this integral equation um, in some way. So you note first that although uh, the right hand side doesn't tell you what uh, u is because it depends on u itself. Um, certainly tells you that if you consider an operator, which is the right hand side of my integral equation, and that operator has a fixed point in some space that you have to find, then that fixed point satisfies the equality, obviously, and that's the solution. And if you apply any kind of fixed point theorem that you know, you also get by, uh, by uh, as a byproduct to uniqueness and also the um, uh, various continuity or even more 
uh, conditions with respect to the initial data. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look for the fixed point of the integral equation. The main issue here, though, is which space of functions that are defined in time t and x, uh, which space should I use in order to apply some of the well-known uh, fixed point theorems that we have? So this brings me to um, the Strickart's estimates. Here I'm gonna, because like I say, I'm gonna only uh, thinking of, uh, for, this, for the sake of this talk, the periodic case. So I'm gonna look at what are the periodic Strickart's estimates. So these are estimates for the linear solution. I'm not yet in the nonlinear case, but the idea is that if we get a bunch of Strickart's estimates or a bunch of estimates for the linear solution, then we can look at the um, fixed point problem right here as um, uh, the non-homogeneous part as a perturbation of the linear part. And if I know a bunch of things about this linear part, then hopefully this will be a small perturbation, at least for small time of small initial data, and I can uh, conclude. So let's concentrate on these uh, estimates. Now, um, let me uh, first write uh, the ones in the periodic case in the uh, in Rn or Rd, there are more of them, but I'm not gonna touch upon that. But they look in the following way. So you take the linear solution and you want it to estimate in some LQ space in the torus and LQ space in a finite interval. Why finite, I'm gonna explain in a moment. So these are local in time um, estimates. And really that's all you can hope for. And I will stress this in a second. And you wanted to, why, why are you interested in this LQ estimates? Well, because uh, the non-homogeneous part has, um, in the case I'm considering a cubic interaction, that's the non-linearity, and uh, um, this Q are related exactly to that uh, cubic interaction. For example, if you are considered a cubic problem, you wanted to have a Q equals four, because by duality, you will hit with another function, then you are looking at the L4 estimates, and uh, that's how you deal with the non-homogeneous part. So you wanted to estimate this uh, um, LQ, LQ um, integrals here in terms of some sobol space, because as I mentioned, it's the L2 base spaces that are very natural for this problem. And so, here I put the initial data and some HS. The question is, what is S in terms of Q, in terms of the dimension? So to fix the idea, let's just consider dimension two. That's an interesting one. And Q equals four, which as I mentioned, is attached to the cubic nonlinearity. A good thing is the fact that uh, um, the linear evolution is completely explicitly written. And you can do that by taking Fourier transform and then just solve an ODE for fixed uh, for, for fixed n. So this is the sum n and z2 because we are in two dimension. This is the Fourier coefficient. And then this is what happens when you solve the Schrodinger problem. There is e to the i t and then alpha 1 and alpha 2 here are here because they are connected with the fact that although I'm in the periodic case, I might be having different periods in different directions. So this is basically one over two pi of the period or something like that. So, but the point is that alpha one and alpha two are positive numbers related to the period. And then n one square and two squared, n one and n two are the value, are the two components of the frequency n. And then I'm reconstructing with respect to the basis. So this is totally explicit. Now, the reason why until Bourguin came along, nobody really knew how to do any kind of estimates here is because these are oscillatory sums. And oscillatory integrals, we know how to deal with that. We have a bunch of estimates about the corporate lemma, a bunch of integration by parts. We know how to do that kind of work. But with sums, we don't know that. At least we didn't know before. So let me, uh, before, before going ahead, let me just make a couple of remarks uh, in terms of definitions. So if the ratio of alpha one and alpha two is a, a rational number, then we call the torus of dimension two rational torus. If the ratio is irrational, we call the torus irrational. And we're gonna immediately see a difference between the two. So um, the first estimate enters in this direction, as I mentioned already, is due to Bourguin in the 90s. 
and he considered the rational torus. In particular, actually, if you look at his calculation, the torus is square. So same period in both directions. And he proved in dimension two that you have an L4 estimates and you uh, need to use, you need to have a little bit of derivative to estimate this L4. Note that if you are in R2, if you are on the plane, here you can actually put the L2, which is in fact the mass. But if you are in the torus, you need a little bit more derivative. One thing that I want you to remark is that here, instead of putting the interval in time zero, one, for example, I put a circle and why is that? So um, this is very simple to understand and it also explains why you should not hope for a, a global in time streetcar system, which is the case when you are on the plane. In fact, if the torus is rational, let's go back to the expression that I already wrote before, this alpha one and alpha two are gonna be natural number. If you are irrational, the, the one of them, for example, think of a square root of two. But if you are rational, alpha one, alpha two are rational number, um, a natural number, and hence you can see that uh, the solution also in time is periodic. That's why you have the uh, circle here. But if you are um, irrational, that's not the case. In any case, um, you are the, like I showed just here, the solution could be periodic in time and hence uh, global um, LP estimates in time are not feasible. That's the first remark. Second remark, if you go through the work of the estimate of Bourguin, which is actually not that complicated, um, at some point you do a, um, a bunch of, you, you, you write the problem in terms of Fourier transform, then you do some holder estimates and you have to count the number of uh, um, lattice points, so in Z2, that satisfies this equation for a fixed R. In other words, you have to count the lattice points on ellipses, but it's a very special ellipsis because this alpha one and alpha two are natural number. Actually, in Bourguin case, alpha one and alpha two is equal one, so really you are looking at the lattice points on the circles, and you wanted to estimate how big is the set sigma that are defined here in terms of the radius, in a sense, of this ellipsis. And that's a, a, an estimate that comes from Gauss lemma, which counts in a many ways, you can write the square of a number in this way. And the, the estimate is sharp, and in other words, it's always certainly less equal than our epsilon, that's where the epsilon comes from in the loss of derivative on the right hand side. So the analytic number theory is actually informing harmonic analysis in the work of Bourguin. And then, uh, well, it took about 20 years to be able to obtain a similar estimates when the torus is just a generic torus, not necessarily a rational torus. And this is a work of Bourguin and Demeter. Surprisingly though, uh, this work of Bourguin and Demeter uh, uses no analytic number theory. It's purely harmonic analysis. It doesn't really see periodicity at all. In fact, the strict assessment comes as a um, corollary of a, a theorem which is called the L2 decoupling theorem. And uh, um, it is related, this L2 decoupling theorem is related to the restriction of the Fourier transform, um, the Kakeya problem, and the uses techniques that uh, um, were uh, in particular brought into the game by Larry Goose and, uh, um, and other people. But I'm not gonna talk about that. But this is just to say that now we have a strict arts estimate for uh, obviously local in time for reason I explained already. And here is the same H epsilon for any torus. Okay. Um, now, improve uh, the kind of just strict arts estimate is not quite enough to um, uh, or to give a proof uh, in terms of uh, the existence of the fixed point and hence the solution is on. You need something a little bit more refined. In fact, those are the Berliner strict arts estimate, and uh, we proved that with some of my postdoc and students. And uh, more interesting is the following fact that you, Deng, Pierre Germain, and Larry Guth prove that the strict estimates for irrational tori actually holds for a longer period of time. I say that the strict estimate 
in, uh, in, the, in this uh, domains, periodic domains um, are local in time, but if you use, if you are considering an irrational torus, then the time of, of, in which you can control the strict cuts estimates are longer. Another interesting fact is that uh, uh, by using similar techniques to the ones that Bruggen and Demeter used for the L2 decoupling, uh, Bruggen, Demeter, and Goose uh, proved um, um, an important conjecture in analytic number theory called the Vinograd of mean value theorem. This is about counting the solution of a system of diaphantine equations. So as now is swinging, the pendulum is swinging in the opposite direction in the sense that harmonic analysis, pure harmonic analysis techniques is in, are informing analytic number theory. Okay, now we switch gears again, and we have a strict arts estimate. We can do our fixed point, and we can prove, and this is actually a result of Bruggen, that uh, the uh, initial value problem that I mentioned at the beginning, both for lambda plus or minus, and x in the torus of dimension two, it's locally will pose in any HS for s strictly greater than zero. This, the fact that s has to be greater than zero is because um, in the strict cuts estimate, you lose a little bit of derivative. By the way, he, as I mentioned, I'm only using this as a, uh, the example to tell my story, but of course, if you change nonlinearity, if you change dimension, there are um, equivalent results. Of course, they have to change them um, because uh, the, um, the strict cuts estimate depend on the dimension and so on. Now, if lambda is equal one, so we are in the defocusing case, then we have a bound also on the kinetic energy which combined with the um, bound on the mass gives us a bound on the total H1 norm. And because this local will pose depends on the time and the time, the local in time depends on the uh, size of the initial data. If we have a unified bound for that size, which does not depend on the time, then you can iterate and you have a global well pose, meaning you can prove in particular, that if you have smooth initial data, you have a unique global smooth solution. So at this point, then the question is, uh, what can we say about the solution of this problem, smooth solution of this problem, which now we know exists globally, as t goes to infinity? So what can we say about that? Um, so this is now what I wanted to um, concentrate on. Now, uh, there is a concept which you can put under the larger umbrella of weak turbulence uh, that is called transfer of energy from low frequency to um, higher frequency, which is also um, uh, known as forward cascade. So let me try to explain with a little cartoon what that means. So in here, in this first picture, this is at time zero, that's my initial profile, but instead of drawing the, um, the U, I'm drawing the size of the Fourier coefficient of U, and I'm squaring it. And I wanna know what happens to it as T goes to infinity, meaning is this bump moving to higher frequencies or there's stuff lingering behind? Now, this is not an easy question because the um, problem is relatively rigid in the sense that you already can see that if I'm looking at the area, the subgraph, that's graph, that's the integral or the sum, if you like, if you are in the discrete setting of these uh, guys, and that's the L2 norm square or the mass. Hence, it's independent of time. So the uh, area of the subgraph should not change as time changes. Um, so even if we move forward, the area of the subgraph is supposed to remain the same. And also, don't forget, you have the constraint of the Hamiltonian. So it is a rigid problem, and that's why it's not easy to, um, to work with it. So the question is uh, then what I just mentioned, which is whether the support of this uh, uh, coefficient is going to move to higher frequency or not. And then harder question is if this motion from low frequency to high frequency transfer of energy happen? Does it happen in a sort of disorganized way? Like you go uh, to higher frequency and you bounce back a little bit, then you keep going, but overall you go down or it's more in a um, wave-like type transport? The second question, it's very hard. The first question we know a little bit, and this is something that uh, um, I'm gonna 
discuss now. So how can we capture this motion from low frequency to high frequency? Well, one way of capturing is by hitting the object we wanted to understand whether it moves to high frequency or not with a weight which emphasizes the motion to high frequency. And of course, you pick that weight to be exactly the one that makes up for your uh, Sobolev norm written in terms of uh, using Planchard. So I'm going to now look at the integral of my coefficient square times this weight, which should emphasize whether the, uh, this function moves to high frequency. And then I discover, in fact, that this is just the HS norm. And here you think of S to be large. So we're really looking at smooth solutions. And what we want to check now is whether as t goes to infinity, this quantity uh, grows or remains bounded, or how it grows, maybe polynomially, maybe logarithmically, or um, what, whatever we can say. Now, from the proof of the global existence, which comes from uh, iteration local existence, you can see, one can prove right away that uh, a bound, uh, which is not very nice, is an exponential bound. Because when you do the iteration, you see that this norm, I mean, your estimates said that this norm might double or might become, um, might grow. So, but this is one first bound that you get and it's just exponential and it's just a byproduct of the proof for the global repulsiveness. But we want to do better. Uh, but let me first also say what uh, a little bit more about the constraints that uh, um, the rigidity of this problem. So the first fact is the following. Uh, if you are in dimension one, cubic NLS or KDV, complete integrability, so the fact that you have this infinitely many conservation laws, uh, can be um, used in order to prove that any HS norm where S is a natural number is actually uniformly bounded. So if you are in dimension one and you're cubic, you should not expect uh, more, the energy moving from low frequency to high frequency. Another constraint is the following. So if you are in R2, so I'm not in the periodic case, but I'm a, I am on the plane, which is a, the situation in which dispersion is fully powerful because there are no boundary conditions, and you are defocusing, um, then the following happens. So I'm using here the cubic, but the same similar kind of results are also available for a higher nonlinearity. But in any case, in R2, the initial value problem that we have been analyzing um, has an important property. There is a scattering. What that means is that uh, the uh, nonlinear solution as t goes to plus or minus infinity approximate a linear one. So if this is the case, then obviously the any HS norm is going to be uniformly bound. By the way, the um, existence of the uh, global solutions at the level of all the way down to L2, that's why I say S greater or equal to zero, is due to Dalton and not even too long ago. He proved it in the 2016. So existence of global solutions were known, but scattering was proved by Dalton. Um, so you have uniform bound because of course, when you are in, finite, uh, in a finite interval, you can use um, continuity and uh, well, the, the fact that, uh, um, okay, so you sum and subtract when you are in a, a far away in time, this is bounded by epsilon, where you are finite in time, there is continuity with respect to time, so existence of the maximum, and then um, it remains the linear um, scattering solution, and that in HS is bounded, it's actually equal, the HS normal U plus, because the uh, shooting group is unitary. So in these two cases, which don't expect, obviously, and it's not true, this uh, moving from low frequency to high frequency. So let's see what happens in the first interesting situation. So we put ourselves in the periodic case and we take the cubic nonlinearity, which is the simpler one. And I'm saying, like I said before many times, this is for smooth data. This is a problem for smooth data. And the first fact that is known is due to Burgen and my um, former student Soinger. And you have, you pass from an exponential band, which is trivial, to a polynomial bound, which is not trivial at all. And the polynomial depends on, uh, the degree of the polynomial depends on S. 
Now, there is a lot more to say on this problem. Uh, there, is a, there are beautiful results, but I will just show you two endpoints. So this is a bound from above. Let me tell you what happens from below. So um, in the previous theorem that I mentioned, uh, we know that the, um, let me go back for a second. So we know that there is a, at, at most can grow polynomial, but the expectation actually is that should not grow more than logarithmic in time in some sense. But then the next question is, uh, do we actually have solutions of this initial problem that grow? That's an open question still, but this is the result that we have. So the first one is in collaboration a few years ago in collaboration with Coleander, Kiel, Takaok, and Tao. And what we proved is the following. So assume S is the order of regularity. Think of it to be large. It's not, uh, this is like I mentioned before, it's a smooth data type of question. Fix a small de delta and fix a very large K. Also assume that the torus is rational. Think about a square torus if you like. Then we can construct an initial data, which is in HS, which has HS norm smaller than delta. And if you wait a very long time, the norm becomes larger than K. Now, this doesn't really tell you that you have a growth, no even logarithm in time. And in fact, doesn't even tell you what happens after capital T. Maybe things go down again. And this is still an open question in a sense. And then there is a companion result by Carl and Fau of a different type. Um, so they don't look at the HS norm. What they do is they actually construct a solution. By the way, this is also in the rational case that excited modes in a very small um, square at time zero, and they can prove, they follow the dynamics and they can prove that uh, at any time large later, you can find something that uh, is still uh, a part of the solution in larger K. Okay, so um, I think, let's see what time it is. So I'm gonna uh, hurry up a little bit. So in order to prove um, the result with uh, um, the I team, we use, um, Monica, sorry, how much time do I have? Uh, one, maximum two minutes. Okay, perfect. So in order, I'm gonna end here. So in order to prove this uh, uh, result um, of the uh, Coliander, Kiela, and Takaoka, and Tao and myself, we look at a toy model to make the, uh, the dynamics much smaller. And, uh, and here, it's this, we reduce things really at dynamical system type of situations. And uh, uh, we have to study the dynamics on, uh, on this big sphere there are uh, constraints in the sense there are big circles where you can get stuck. So it's not obvious that you can go from low frequency to high frequency, but we actually do that. And uh, this is a little bit of a picture um, how uh, the situation goes. The last thing I wanna mention is that the, this kind of construction that tells us that we can go from a low to high is in the rational torus. So what happens if you, and also the construction of Carl and Fau is in the rational torus. And with Bobby Wilson, we proved that actually, if you are irrational, if you are in an irrational torus, both this construction cannot be done. What that means is that in the irrational torus, which is intuitively correct, um, constructing something that grows is gonna be harder because as you hit the boundary and you have an irrational torus, you have a slightly more room to bounce back and not necessarily go back to where you came from and hence, accelerate the, the non-linearity in there. So there is a lot more to say on that, but I wanna just mention a few other people that have been working on this. Yu Deng, Germain, Gust for the rational to rise, then um, of course I mentioned Burgen, Wami Wang, Berthe Masper, and then House of Procese Guarde Kaloshi, these are really dynamic system people. And Gerard de did a lot more for the Zego equation. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, I didn't manage to go to the, zig, to the uh, symplectic uh, problem or to the probabilistic approach on this, but I'm happy to give reference if anybody would like to see that part. Thank you, Monica.